Well, good morning, New City Church, and uh, thanks for joining us at our first service uh, today at New City. I want to begin with a true story of a man named Timothy Treadwell. Some of you may be familiar with him, although probably most of you are not. Uh, He was an elite swimmer and diver in high school. He ended up getting a full scholarship to Bradley University where he was going to swim there. And when he first started going to school, he was doing pretty well, but eventually he got involved in drugs and alcohol, and his life began to spiral and kind of of completely went downhill from there. Uh, At some point in the midst of all of this, he had a friend who was from Alaska, and so at some point he decides to go visit his friend just to get away from all the, the craziness of life. And while they were there, they had an encounter in the woods with a grizzly bear, a grizzly bear. And during this encounter, something went went off inside of Timothy, and from that moment on, from the grizzly bear, he stopped using drugs and alcohol completely. He gets all into grizzly bears and essentially decides to dedicate his life to studying them, getting to know them, and befriending them. So just so we're clear, it wasn't AA, it wasn't rehab, it wasn't some sort of intervention, it was the bears. Okay, it was the bears that got him clean. And so for years, you can actually look him up. There's been some news articles about this. There's a documentary about this guy. Um, He would continue to fly back to Alaska to be around the bears. And in his mind, these bears had become his friends. They'd become his family. And eventually, he starts bringing other people out there with him when he goes and camps at these sites where all these bears are. And the last few times he went, he brought his girlfriend at the time with him. Now, she was understandably pretty scared of all the bears, and, uh, but he would convince her it's all going to be okay, don't need anything to worry about. And then they would also film the bears. They would film the bears, their interaction with them. Like he has, there's film of like the bears letting him pet them and all these sort of things. And then one day when they were leaving their campsite from the last, their latest trip, they go back to the airport. Uh, they had a close encounter with one of the bears on their last day, and it was uh, near the fall, and so hibernating season was coming up. And apparently there was less, you know, the, the hunt, there was less food that summer in Alaska, and so the bears were a little bit more agitated than normal. So they had this scare, but they leave, they go to the airport. And there was a dispute about ticket pricing because there was flight cancellations because it was Alaska. And so they decided they weren't going to fly out that day. He convinces his girlfriend to go back out with him to camp for a few more days with the bears before they leave. Now, this was September 2003, and it was the last time that they were seen alive. And again, there is an, uh, there's a whole documentary on this. It, it probably is a case study in how to be an idiot. Like, that's what this is about. In fact, um, what's really sad, this is true as well, they actually had the camera rolling during part of their attack where they were killed. Um, You can't see anything, either had fallen on the ground or the cap was still on it, but you can hear him screaming while he's being mauled, and you can hear her screaming that she doesn't want to die. Now, here's what happened in this situation, right? This guy had lost all respect for the power and the might of grizzly bears. See, what he had done is he had presumed, he had presumed, that the bears had befriended him, that they would be gentle towards him, and they literally took his life. They took his life. And I I share that story because this, if we are not careful, this is what we can do with God. That just like Timothy Treadwell, we can forget who we're actually dealing with, like who God actually is. Like Paul says in Romans chapter 2, that we have presumed the kindness of God upon us. That we have presumed this is how God should and will act towards us. And I think what makes it hard is is we all know the truth, the truth, that Jesus loves us, that he gave his life for us, that by Jesus's grace and mercy, we are saved, that he is a friend of sinners, and that he welcomes the outcast. All of these things are true. Yet at the same time, we can easily forget, especially in a culture that talks a lot about love without actually defining what love actually is, that Jesus at the same time also sits throned on high, that all things were created through him, that he is the king of kings, that he is the Lord of lords, and that scripture tells us that the mountains will tremble at the second coming of Christ. They will flee his presence. And so what you have here is a perfect and holy and a blameless God that will destroy every impure thing in front of it. That what you see in the scriptures is that none of us, no one can stand before his presence and survive unless your holiness can match his. And spoiler alert, it can't. And what this means, it is not how we often like to think of it. Like, it is not that if you're more holy or good than the average person in your life, or you're more holy and good than your coworkers or your neighbors, what matters is whether or not you can stand face to face with an all perfect, all consuming, holy holies of God and live. 
That's actually the question. And so what you see, the, the covering of Jesus' blood, that is what protects us. That is what gives us the holiness that we have not earned and have not deserved so that we can enter into God's presence and live. It's not us. It's about Jesus' sacrifice for us. And so the beauty of the gospel of Jesus is that he takes the justified wrath of God against sin and wickedness by absorbing it on the cross. And what Jesus does is he imputes, which means he gives us, as his perfect righteousness is transferred to those who trust and believe in him. That our righteousness is given to us not by our awesomeness, but by Christ. That your sin was traded for Christ's righteousness and that the great exchange of Jesus' sacrifice counted for you if you trust and repent and follow him. And and so this morning, as we continue our series in Made for More, what we're going to talk about over the next couple of minutes is holiness. That you were made for holiness. And that to be in the family of God is actually to pursue holiness in your life and my life. Now, to give you a real quick, a definition of holiness, you can, dis- you can define it this way. Holiness means to be set apart. Holiness means to be set apart. You see, God is holy. He is set apart. He is absolutely perfect. There is nothing like him. There is no one like him that he is incomparable. There is no sin. There is not a hint of wickedness. There is no wrongdoing in our Lord. He is set apart. And again, what we often think is, well, I'm not, I'm not perfect, but like overall, I'm a good person, or overall, I do more good than bad, and so I, I should be allowed into the good place when I die. And I just want to say, that kind of posture is to be completely ignorant of who God is. And I don't mean that like pejoratively, but I mean just the basic definition of, the, of, the, of ignorance, like not knowing, that is to be ignorant of who God is. It reveals our ignorance of who God is to us, that Jesus, that God is holy, that he is set apart. I've explained it this way before, you know, our son Roman, he's six, and so, you know, he's on this rec soccer team. Yesterday was like their first game of the year, and, you know, with rec, it's kind of random, but his team was really good. I don't know how this happened, but like most of the kids on his team actually try, and so the first season, they were like seven and one, and then last year, they didn't, they were eight and oh, and then yesterday, they, they destroyed the team that they played, and so they, they always win. And because they're all, their kids are good, and, and at that age means they just have to try. Like, as long as you try, you can be good when you're six years old. Um, they, they blow out, they, they, they win like, it's like eight to two every single game. Eight to two every time. And so he scores like all these goals. Last year, he scored three goals. He scored four goals one day. And so he does like really well because his team is awesome. But here's the thing. He's in a rec league with six-year-old boys against other six-year-olds, half of whom have no idea what's going on. Like, they're, like, they're not paying attention. But if you were to put Roman, our son, who's like doing awesome against six-year-olds with eight-year-olds, he would never score. And if you put him on a team with 12-year-olds, he would never play. And if you put him on a team with professional soccer players, he would literally die. Like that's what would happen. That's what would happen. And I just like to remind us this morning, we are a bunch of six-year-olds running around comparing ourselves to other six-year-olds thinking we are good. When, it is, when in reality, it's not the six-year-old with his shoe untied and picking his nose that we need to compare ourselves with. That's not the standard. God is the standard. God is the standard. And we fall short. And so we need the one who has no, who has no, no sin to be sin on our behalf. The only comparison, the only comparison that matters when you stand before God is not you versus everyone else. It's you versus God and his holiness will destroy you. So welcome to New City Church. You picked a great Sunday to be here. Now the question then is, what do we do? If if the nature of God is perfect and holy and just against wickedness and sin, what do we do? Well, this morning I'm going to read a couple of scriptures. Everything will be on the screen. You can turn there in the Bibles if you want, but everything will be on the screen this morning. I want to read a, a couple of scriptures of how we should respond to the holiness of God. Exodus chapter 19, God is saying this to Moses. This is as the Israelites have left Egypt pretty recently. They're traveling to the promised land. Here's what God says. Now, if you, listen, if you carefully listen to me and keep my covenant, you will be my own possession out of all the peoples. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be my kingdom of priests and my holy nation. These are the words that you are to say to the Israelites. So so because I am holy, the people that I'm calling out, you are to reflect my holiness. In Leviticus chapter 19, when they're given the law of Moses and all these things to the Israelites, it says this, the Lord spoke to Moses, speak to the entire Israelite community and tell them, be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. 
Leviticus 20, God says this, Consecrate yourselves and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. Keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord who sets you apart. Later on, Leviticus 20, you are to be holy because I am, because you are to be holy to me because I, the Lord, am holy. And I have set you apart from the nations to be mine. Now, the, first, the New Testament also picks up on this theme of holiness. 1 Peter chapter 1, the Apostle Peter writes this, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. That is, before you started following the Lord Jesus. But as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Or last passage we'll read, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul writes this, for God has not called us to impurity, but to live in holiness. So the call for the Christian, what we see throughout the scriptures is this, that you are called to be holy. It matters. That we are saved by grace, but we are called to live in such a way that reflects our Savior. You are called to holiness. Now, now to be clear what this looks like, um, especially if you've been following Jesus for a while, like let's say you've been following Jesus for a while, and let's say you're walking out to your parking lot, to the car today in the parking lot after church, or maybe after you go to lunch or somewhere this week, and someone walks up to you and just and offers you crack cocaine. Like, are you making a list of like weighing the pros and cons? Like, you're probably not. Like, you just know, like, I, that's not something I'm going to do. That's not wise. That's foolish. Like, that, I'm not going to do that. Like, you just know. And so can I just encourage the, the follower of Jesus here this morning? The enemy is probably not going to come at you like that because you know. But, but what about maybe binging three seasons of your favorite show on Netflix over the weekend because on Monday season four is coming out and you want to know what's going on? Or, or what about maybe the habits and the social changes that COVID brought about a couple of years ago that we're still kind of living in? Like, where in your life do you maybe need to reevaluate some of your, how you spend your time, or maybe some of the coping strategies that maybe were helpful a couple of years ago, but are now detrimental for your long-term health? You, you see, for, for many of us, the enemy gets us not with crack cocaine, but with marinating in mediocrity for settling for lesser things. That things that might not necessarily be bad, but lesser. And so what we are encouraged to do is to run and to strip off ourselves from things that are not good for us. L l let me read to you Hebrews chapter 12. Here, you see what it says in, in Hebrews chapter 12. It says this, um, therefore, since we have a, such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us. So he's talking about Hebrews chapter 11, all these people who have maybe, most of them had died for their faith as they were following Jesus and following the Lord in the Old Testament. So and that, that is our example. He says, let us lay aside every hindrance, uh, every hindrance, uh, let, sorry, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. The race that lies before us. So we, we are called to be holy. And so if you're, ever, if you're ever asking like, man, what's God's will for my life? Here it is. God's will for your life is to be holy, to pursue holiness, not conformity to the wor world, but conformity to our Messiah Jesus. It's not just simply doing more good than bad or trying to balance the scales. What it is, is holiness. That's what he has called us to, to actually pursue holiness. Um, let me give you an example of this. Uh, years ago, when my younger brother was moving into college, uh, it was me, my mom, and my grandmother. We were moving him into his dorm room. And um, I, <laughs> and so again, we're called to be holy, set apart. So we go in, and it's the day that we're moving. Like we stay the night, whatever. We pack the car up. And uh, my grandmother, I had, I had flip flops on that morning, and she was telling me I need to wear shoes because we're moving. And I was like, you know, actually, no, Grandma, that's not what I actually need to do. Because what's happening is it was one of those things where you would go to the curb and, they, and you would just pull up, and they would, you would. Un I went to UNCW. They did the same thing. Like you'd pull up to the dorm, and they would have all these volunteers who would bring your stuff to the to your dorm room for you. So I'm like, why would I wear shoes? Like it's fine. Like it's good enough. We're not actually going to move. And I was right. I was right. And so we pull up. And uh, everything gets loaded, and we go into well, my younger brother Logan his, was, is his name, and we go to his room, and we start uh, unpacking the things. And so, like all the bad stuff is hard, like it didn't have to move, whatever. And uh, after a while, um, we decide to uh, change the, the height of his bed. I have a picture of the bed. If you want to throw this up there, 
Um, if you're familiar with these dorm room beds, these beds, you can, they've got four, like, they're, they're made of metal, and in the, in the the middle part is metal, and they've got four hooks on each corner, and you can raise the height of the beds, so you can like store stuff other. And so we get into the dorm room, and it's probably about this height. And, and Logan said he wanted to raise it to the top bar, and so we we unhook the metal things, and we pick it up, and then I hook in my side. I was on the left side, so my side is hooked in all the way on the top. It's like four feet tall, and then he takes his side, and then he hooks it in. And as he hooks his side in, um, in slow motion, and this all happens very slow motion in my, in my mind as I'm watching this, my side apparently was not hooked in, and the metal bar came out. And it was like slow motion, like I could just see it coming, and it lands right on my foot, my bare foot. And it was metal on bone, it bounced, it was like a trampoline, it was like, that's what it did. Like it was just like, like this, under the ground. And uh, so this metal spike, and then it was like a volcano. And when I say volcano, I don't mean like the movies where they're just like, like volcanoes, it's just like a constant flow of lava. That was my foot. In fact, I have a picture. No, just kidding. I do have a picture. We do have a picture because, of course, we got it, but I will not show it up here. If you want to see it after the service, let me know. But it was like just blood. Like it just, it was just coming out. And then all of a sudden, I was like, I had to sit down. I was like, I'm going to pass out. Like everything started turning purple. I got to pass out. My mom's like, Dylan, don't pass out. I'm like, it's not my choice. Like I have no option in this. And so like it was bad. Unfortunately, his roommate's mom had like these cookies. And so like we're like trying to eat these cookies. At this point, my brother's in the bathroom trying not to throw up. Right? And what happened was I thought in this story, like I thought I was fine. It was good enough. We weren't moving the boxes. I didn't even do anything. And it cost me a lot of blood and a good little scar on my, fo- on my foot. And I, and I share that here because, listen, God has not asked us, he has not asked you or me to be fine or to justify or excuse our behavior. He calls us to be holy. That's what he calls us to, to do the right things because what God does is always right. Again, I just want to read this again. Hebrews 12, the, the author of Hebrews says this, Therefore, since we have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside, this is important, lay aside every hindrance and sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. Now, uh, the wording here that says lay aside, it is an appropriate translation of the Greek, but it's actually not very helpful for how we understand English in like our modern day because lay aside gives the idea of just take it off, like just shrug it off, like just gently remove it from you. Like you kind of fold the laundry and you lay it aside. You kind of gently put it away. But lay aside, what the author is here is communicating, it's not just like this like nice, soft, like just move it. What he's actually saying here is like, get it off me. Like, not gently, but like, let me go. And so what is it here that the author is trying to tell us to lay aside or to get us off from or, or to break free from? Well, it is anything that is a hindrance. And a hindrance here is not the morally, sorry, now hindrance here in Hebrews is the morally neutral lesser loves. So it's not just like the really big bad sins, but it's the morally neutral things that we allow us, if we are not careful, to lay us down. Not explicitly the sinful stuff, although we should, lay, we should take those things off of us as well. But here it's about the things that rob us from hungering and thirsting for the beauty of Jesus. It's to watch out for these things that become a hindrance to us. It makes me think of when I was a kid... We would go to my, my grandparents' house for Thanksgiving and Christmas every year. My grandmother was an amazing cook. And we, all, we, all, we also would have this dessert table of like Rice Krispies, peanut butter balls, cookies, brownies, like all this stuff. And so we would do this. And what would happen as I was a kid before I realized that I came to my senses, um, I would begin to be filled up on these lesser things and then be less excited for literally the best meal I would have the entire year. Like Christmas Eve, I mean, we're talking like steak like really good steak, not the manager's specials you buy at the food line that's 50% off because and it's got mold on the inside because it's cheap. Like really good steak, baked potato. And uh, my wife to this day still like cringes when I do this, but I don't care. My grandmother makes the best baked potato and I have her like actually make my potato. I have her cut it up, put the cheese for the sour cream, the butter. Like she's just, I guess there's a sprinkling of love in there. It is so good. So I'm like, BB's what we call her. I was like, you know, you know what to do. And she's still to this day, if I'm at her house, she will make my baked potato. So this um, this elaborate spread, and here's what I was doing. I was trading that for some chocolate-covered pretzels and a Rice Krispie treat. Like lesser things that are not bad, but like for the six hours before that meal, you should not be eating them because they are becoming a hindrance from enjoying what's good. And so I just like want to encourage us this morning. Settling, Settling doesn't lead to holiness. So yes, the big bad things we need to be careful of. But where are the things in our life that we settle, that we spend too much time on, that that aren't sins in and of themselves, that become a hindrance to us? 
Again, you know that you probably shouldn't be smoking crack cocaine or however you consume that stuff. I don't know, right? But what you might not know, <laughs> that's good that I don't know this, guys, okay? That's good. And sometimes when I share things or like when I like cars, I don't have work, people come up to me after service and like tell me how it actually goes. If you come up to me after service and you tell me how crack cocaine actually works, I will have questions, okay? <laughs> I will have questions. But the enemy, again, is not coming out to you like that. It's these lesser things. And what the author of Hebrews is telling us is to one array, is to strip these things off. And how do we do it? Well, we, we do it, as the author says, with endurance. With endurance, we chase after Jesus, which means it is not easy. It is not always convenient. Sometimes it is actually really hard because nobody endures things that are easy, right? You don't endure a vacation, right? You don't enjoy, endure having a good time with your friends, and I think it's also worth understanding that the scripture also does not apologize for this. It does not, Jesus does not apologize for us taking the narrow road in our life. In fact, maybe to encourage you, maybe some of you right now, right now are having to endure. Some of you right now, things you're dealing with in your life, you can relate to like what, this, what, the, what David writes in the book of Psalms when he says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Like right now, some of you are having to Endure. So the question is, we should lay aside things that hinder us from our holiness, but how do we endure? Like we are not holy as God is holy, even though he calls us to be holy. Uh, we all sin. We all have a tendency to presume God's kindness over us in our life. We all know what it is like to be lulled to sleep by mediocre things and not chase after the Lord. So how do we endure? Well, in verse 2, the author of Hebrews says this. Here's how we endure. By keeping our eyes on Jesus the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So according to the scriptures, how you don't do it is by trying really hard on your own. That's not how you endure. How do you do it? By, by looking at Jesus, because he is the source. He is the perfecter. He is the encourager of our faith. It's not you. It's not you, by looking to Jesus. And so if I could just say, man, if you feel maybe weighed down by all this talk about holiness, if you feel weighed down by that, or like, man, here's all the ways I am not holy and I don't measure up, you should. But you should. A right posture of God is, I am not good enough. I have sinned. I cannot live up to your standard. Not because the feeling of weightiness is good, but because only then can you really see the glory of the Lord and the magnificent of all Christ has done for you. That this is what Jesus did, not you. Jesus endured the cross. That Jesus took our shame and Jesus defeated sin and darkness and sat down at the right hand of God because it is finished. It is finished. And again, the gospel, the good news of the gospel is that his presence, the presence of God in holiness is available to us right now, to anyone who calls on the name of of Jesus. Jesus makes you pure. Jesus makes you holy. And in response to that, we live lives that are honorable to God. And so here's what we should do. Hebrews chapter 12, a few verses down in verse, uh, verses 12 and 13, the author then says this, therefore, in light of all that Jesus has done for us, strengthen your tired hands and weakened knees and make straight paths for your feet. So what is lame may not be dislocated, but healed instead. In other words, let your faith be strengthened by Christ in what he has done for you and pursue holiness in response to what he has done for you as this is an actual sign that you are following Jesus. Not just say that you follow Jesus, but the holiness you pursue in your life is a response and is a sign that you're actually following him. It is not a test of salvation, but it is a response to it. That, that you, are, you and I are to look at our lives and see, man, where are the areas that we are falling short of God's holiness? And as you do so, maybe as you maybe feel the, the weightiness of your sin and your lack of holiness, here is what you and I need to remember, okay? That holiness comes from Jesus, not before Jesus. Holiness comes from Jesus, not before Jesus. It is not something you can grant or attain on your own. It is something given to you by God that you live into. 
It, it reminds me, uh, we're watching season four of The Chosen right now. Many of you might be familiar with it. It's like the, the show about Jesus' life. And, and they add a lot of stuff in there that aren't biblical. Personally, like, I don't have a problem with it because, like, it's a show and it's fine. And, you know, they don't claim to, like, do all these things. And so, anyway, it, it's, it's really great, though. I, I recommend it. You, there's an app you can download. It's free. And so season four, I guess, came out a little bit ago. And so we're watching it right now. And there's a scene in the season four, episode two where Matthew is talking to Jesus. Now, this is not in the Bible, so this is not like something that actually happened. However, I do think it is a great depiction of our Lord. And in this episode, it's this episode where, where Jesus changes Peter's name from Simon to Peter, and all the disciples are kind of feeling some sort of way about it, because it's like, oh, why is Jesus, Peter so special? Like, why does he get to be the leader? That sort of thing. And so they're like camping at night, and all the disciples are arguing, and then Matthew goes over to talk with Jesus, because Matthew's kind of upset about these things. And, you know, he's like, you called Peter the rock, and he's like, Peter's not a rock. Like, at least in The Chosen, like, he's, sometimes he's emotional, he can, like, be, he, he can get angry really quickly, whatever. And so he's all, all these, he's, like, upset, like, Peter's not, or G, Peter is not, Simon, sorry, he's not Peter. He doesn't act like a Peter. Like, why would you do that? Why would you give him this name? And Jesus looks at him, again, this isn't scriptural, but I think this is an accurate presentation of Jesus. One of the things Jesus says to Peter, he says, Peter, I make people what they aren't. I make people what they aren't. Listen, if you do not yet know Jesus, your invitation is first and foremost to experience him. It is not, it is not to change what you wear, what you watch, what you say, what you, where you live, how you live. Your first uh, inv invitation is to taste and see that the Lord is good. The first step is to acknowledge the holiness of God and the gift of grace that he offers us in Jesus is to trust and repent and believe on his name and not on your works. And for those of us that are followers of Christ, would we remember and start here that Jesus has invited us in, that, that Jesus loves us and gives us grace, and then appropriately respond to the holiness of God by being serious about sin and the unholiness that we put up with in our life. That we would, we would be reflective of our Father in how we live. This is what uh, the scriptures are encouraging us to do. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, the last thing we'll read, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul is talking about all these promises that we have in, the, in, 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 in Jesus, in, the, in our Lord. And then it says this, verse 1. So then, dear friends, since we have these promises, all these good things that God gives us, because of that, let us cleanse ourselves from every impurity of the flesh and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. In other words, that we would have an appropriate, reverent fear of God, that we would not presume upon his kindness. And in other words, if I could maybe sum up what we're seeing here this morning, that the call from scriptures for those of us that are followers of Jesus is this, that we are to live set apart because we are set apart. We are to live set apart because we are set apart. You are to live how you were actually created to live. Remember, Jesus makes us holy, and he invites us to live out of that in holiness. And so as I end this morning, can I just ask, like, where in your life right now is this not true? And not just like maybe, maybe kind of not sure, but like, you know, if you're a follower of Jesus this morning, you have the Spirit of God literally living inside of you. Where do you know right now that you are not pursuing holiness? Where do you know? It makes me think of, there was this show that was on, I guess a couple decades ago now, uh, called When Animals Attack, okay? And it was when animals attacked. Humans, typically for humans being idiots, you know, like Timothy Treadwell could have made an appearance on the show. And there was this one episode of a lion uh, and a woman. It was for a shampoo commercial, and I guess a lion has a mane, whatever, so I guess they're trying to be cute with it. And, and at some point, I mean, this didn't make the commercial, obviously, but they've got cameras rolling. At some point during the filming of all of this, the lion turns around and starts attacking the woman. Now, they have all these trainers everywhere, so they're like trying to pull the lion off, whatever, and they do all these things. And after the fact, um, they had someone interviewing uh, the trainer about what happened. And the trainer could not believe that this lion attacked this woman. They could not believe it. They were talking about how like they had, they had raised a lion since it was a cub and it's always been nothing but gentle around humans. Like he could not believe that, that the lion acted like a lion. I couldn't believe it. And can I just say, I mean, some of you, if you're not careful, have little pet sins that you treat as cute little lions, cute little cubs that you think you can control. 
you think you can control. Let me just tell you, that cub is going to grow up and it will kill you. Man, it will devour you. It will lead you down a path five years from now that you will, could never imagine that you would be right now. All because you thought you could handle it on your own. Because you thought, if you're a follower of Jesus, that holiness does not matter. That you are presuming upon the kindness of God. And so, man, for all of us this morning, where is it? Is there a secret sin in your life that nobody knows about? Man, it maybe is that how you speak about coworkers or, you know, the workplace is a hard spot where everyone else is gossiping. Are you playing part in that? Is there a content you consume? Or maybe the content in and of itself isn't bad, but how much time you spend on it, right? Where in your life are you not following in the way of Jesus? And I'm not talking about being perfect and never messing up, but I'm like, you know, you know you're not pursuing Jesus in the way that he's calling you to pursue him in that area. Uh, listen to me this morning. We need to drag out the sin of our lives and kill it. That is what the scripture says, that we are in a war and we will lose if we do not fight. Would we not presume upon the kindness of God, but rather would we allow God's kindness to lead us to repentance and live lives of holiness? So listen, I'm going to pray in a second. And, and, and as always, you know, we're going to have people praying down front up here. You don't even have to like maybe say exactly what's going on. But if there's a sin or man, there's a struggle in your life, man, we'd love to pray for you. Man, if you're experiencing the difficulty of life and you just need to endure because life is hard, and you need someone to like grieve with you, we'd love to do that. Man, man if we were going to be people, men and women of God, listen, you were made for holiness. You were made to live in the image of God so that those in your life can see Jesus, not just from what they read in the scriptures, but what they read in your life. We were made for holiness. So would that be true of us? Would you pray with me? Hey, thanks so much for checking out this video. We upload new videos every week to help encourage you in your faith in Jesus. So be sure to subscribe to this channel so that you'd never miss a thing.